Welcome back to the Testudo Talk podcast. I'm Andrew Chodis. This is going to be a little bit of a weird podcast format because I just got back um, on the drive from Piscataway where Maryland football beat Rutgers. Co-host Emmett Siegel, he was in College Park where Terps men's basketball defeated South Alabama. So we're recording these reactions separately. So I'm going to be just talking about uh, Maryland's 42 to 24, really impressive win um, against Rutgers. The main storyline, of course, is going to be Talia Tagovailoa with a fourth touchdown performance. Uh, he became the Big Ten's all-time passing yards leader. Obviously, his career has been – he cemented uh, definitely a legacy for himself in College Park. Uh, ultimately, you know, there's a lot of conversation around, well, he wasn't able to get a significant win. But if you remember where Maryland's quarterback situation was before this, it was in shambles. Uh, Maryland hadn't had a winning season from 2015 to 2020, and he's led them to three straight winning seasons, three straight bowl game appearances, and he is now atop uh, the Big Ten leaderboard for career passing yards. So just a congr- uh, unbelievable accomplishment for him. Um, congratulations to him and his family. We're both there at the game. Probably one of the best conferences, press conferences we've had yet with uh, – Spoke to Talia. He got really emotional. Um, the Maryland staff showed him a video video message of uh, of his family, his parents, his brother Tua. You know, giving him a, a message. He started to get emotional of that on the with the video. That was really cool to see. Uh, we also spoke to the Ty Felton and Billy Edwards. Billy Edwards, who has five running touchdowns in his past two games after a two touchdown performance today, he was he was he was that was the first time we spoke to him all season. That was a uh, that was a fun talk. He uh, he was asked what you know what name they should be coining his uh, his little tush push, if you will, and he said you know the turtle push the turtle push has been uh, going around a little bit uh, with his two touchdowns against Rutgers. I was calling it the Piscataway push, but either way, it's a really effective move. And I mean to have five touchdowns in a uh, in two weeks, and you know what they 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 were important today. Um, you know Maryland to kind of go in, into the game specifically. Uh, Maryland comes out absolutely flying. Uh, Talia Tagovailoa starts off absolutely ridiculous. He cannot miss. Uh, in the in Maryland's first four drives, went touchdown, 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 touchdown. Yeah, pretty impressive. So it was twenty eight to three. Before you know it, uh, T- Talia Tagovailoa had two hundred, had almost two hundred yards with four total touchdowns midway through the second quarter. That is incredible. And he ended up getting, he ended up breaking the record. He needed 269 yards before the game started to get it. And he ended up breaking it with uh, just a little, uh, like around two minutes left in the, um, in the first half. But, you know, the game was 28 to three. And then Maryland started to do what it's done way too often this season. And it starts to make mistakes. Right, so you have twenty-eight to three. Rutgers puts together a nice drive. It's twenty-eight to ten. That was they, they you know, they uh, they put the ball in their best playmaker's hands. Kyle Mnungai, they're running back, and he kind of led them. Um, led led the way. He finished the game with a hundred and eighteen yards. But I mean, once that game gets twenty-eight ten, Maryland drives all the way down the field. They they have a huge. They have a a, a couple of huge passes, um, and then they're at the eleven yard line and. A dump off to Coley McDonald. Tiger Lowe actually only needed four yards at this point to break the record. So there's a little dump off to Coley McDonald. Again, you have an opportunity to make the score 35 to 10. And instead, Colby McDonald fumbles. All right. So now you take momentum. Instead of 35 to 10, it's still 28 to 10. So Rutgers has a long field to go. They have to punt. But uh, so, but he still takes away momentum. But right after that ensuing drive, so Leah Tagovailoa throws a bad interception. Just a, he didn't need to make it a bad decision. Next play, Gavin Wimsett, Rutgers quarterback, who actually ended up having a really ineffective game in the end. But where 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 we were now, late in the second quarter, there was a forty four yard pass, the one yard line. Rutgers finishes that out with a touchdown. Next thing you know, you know this game could have been thirty five to ten. Now it's twenty eight seventeen. Rutgers has the ball to start the second half. Right, and we've seen a lot of times when something bad happens to Maryland this season, you look you look no further than the game at Ohio State, you know, and the kind of fault in the second half. The complete opposite thing happened in the second half. The defense was absolutely 
Tremendous. Uh, Rutgers gets the ball um, in the second half. They can't move it at all. Um, the only time they were able to move the ball was on their second to last drive of the game, late in the fourth quarter, when they just gave the ball to a non guy and, and he and he made it a uh, he made it a, a two possession game. But then Maryland came came right back. But in general, Maryland's defense was absolutely sensational uh, in the second half. It was they held Rutgers to just that one point, uh, just that one touchdown. Um, as I mentioned. Um, Maryland, uh, Glenn Miller had an interception. Uh, Tarheeb still almost had a pick six, but the ball went right through his hands. But, I mean, the secondary was was awesome. Um, they just, like I said, Gavin Winsett really couldn't do much, um, really couldn't do much uh, today at all. He uh, finished 13 of 34 with 165 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. Rutgers had it to weigh a little bit on the ground, but they only had one big play, which is considered over 15 yards um, with, the, with their running backs. So kind of held them in check. And you kind of look, if you, do, if you look, if you look outside of the, of the turnovers, Maryland's defense really only allowed like two touchdowns. And then obviously the what Rutgers last touchdown it wasn't in garbage time, but it was towards the end of the game. And it would have been very difficult um, for them to, to, to come back, but Kind of, yeah, so Maryland played a really good game. Obviously, a few mistakes in there, but overall executed well. They were really efficient, um, 42-24 victory. And with that, I think we can start to talk um, a little bit of a uh, of a bigger picture, right? Uh, so Maryland, they were, you know, they were 5-5, five and five and people thought 5-4 um, at this point, and people were like, is Maryland going to, you know, win any of their next three games? You know, it, it wasn't easy. Penn State. Uh, five and three, Penn State, Michigan, Nebraska on the road, and then Rutgers on the road. Penn, Penn State, they got they got killed. Uh, Michigan, they played really well. Fell the you know fell in the fourth quarter, and then they go on the road to Nebraska, pull off a gritty win, and they just and against Rutgers from the opening kickoff to the final whistle, they were the better team. So you make a bowl game, you have another seven win season. You have a chance to go eight wins with a bowl game, and I'll tell you this: the the media room was 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 right next to the visit to the visiting locker room. Man, were those guys hype, and, and man, were they happy and excited for each other. A lot of it obviously has to do with, uh, you know, with Talia breaking the record, but it was it was an electric scene, and it's it's been a lot of, you know, not so exciting press conferences, but man, every every guy who who stood up there, uh, obviously when Loxley came up all positives, which we haven't heard in a while. And it was just all positives um, from all the guys. And and I think we can kind of also preview a little bit of the bowl game situation. So the teams that are bowl eligible in the Big Ten. So you have Michigan, Ohio State, Iowa, Nebraska, Iowa, Northwestern, Rutgers, Maryland. So Maryland is probably going to end up in one of the Las Vegas Bowl, the Guaranteed Rate Bowl in Phoenix, um, the the Quick Lane Bowl in Detroit, uh, the Bowl Game in Tampa, Florida, I forget its name, or the Music City Bowl in Nashville. So when we were going through the locker room to get to the press conference, I won't say who, but there were some players who were audibly expressing their desire to uh to play in Vegas and that was also heard when we were in the locker room chance of Vegas 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 um could be very interesting uh there's a if they were to be put in the Las, Las Vegas Bowl uh it, it would go, it would be against the Pac-12 team not out of the question for it to be a team like USC somehow um UCLA is obviously an option but I, I would say, just based on what I've heard and, and history, I would say uh, the, the Las Vegas and Guaranteed Rate Bowl, that's in Phoenix, are probably uh, the, the two most likely options for the bowl game for them to be in. Uh, the Pinstripe Bowl is probably going to be Rutgers, just of their location, and a six-win team kind of makes sense. Um, Iowa is probably going to be in the Citrus Bowl. Um, the Music City Bowl in Nashville... <sighs> Outside chance, I'll speak just my personal opinion. That's where I want them to go, just as a, a student journalist covering the team. I mean, 
who isn't going to say uh, who's going to say no to a uh, to a weekend in New Year's in Nashville and play a really good opponent uh, in a pretty high profile game in the Music City Bowl. But um, you know uh, Maryland, and you know this was a season that started off so positive and then was really negative and. You know, we we had some of our reactions. We're like, this team is just not good. And they ended the season on a positive. And they kind of, they proved me wrong a little bit. Obviously not the ultra successful season they were hoping for. But ultimately, right, it's a, you know, you end the season on a positive note with your seat. And this is a good point that Mike Loxley made, right? If you look at the senior class that came in with COVID, Maryland had six losing seasons in a row. And they finished with three winning seasons. And while maybe you didn't, change the culture completely you definitely sh- those guys starting with talking about well obviously shifted it in a tremendously positive way and if they can build on this in the recruiting trail i don't know obviously in the in the in the world of nil and with the big 10 expanding when you're breaking in you know washington and, and and usc and 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 oregon right those are three teams that are you know literally washington and oregon competing for the uh, for a college football playoff spot, so a, a lot to, a lot of things you know to consider. But obviously, the past three years have been a tremendous tremendous uh, step up for Maryland football of what it was from twenty fifteen to uh, to twenty twenty. And there and the season isn't over, right? I mean, I'm talking like it's over. It's not. I mean, you're you're in a bowl game. Um, as many of the players expressed, like I said before, they uh, they really want to take their talents to the Sin City. We'll see what happens. We will find that out on Sunday, December 3rd. Uh, with that part, I believe we are now going to shift it over to Emmett Siegel to discuss Maryland men's basketball 68-55 to win against South Alabama. Thank you, Andrew, for that breakdown of the Maryland football game against Rutgers. Another great win. Finished the regular season 7-5 and five and ending it on a positive note as they head into bowl season is always great to see. Like Andrew said, I'm Emmett Siegel, and I was in College Park for the men's basketball game between Maryland and South Alabama. Won that Maryland won 68-55. It was not a resounding victory for Maryland by any means, but, but a comfortable one in the second half at least, uh, Maryland started to pull away at the beginning of the second half after a a narrow uh, margin at halftime and then kind of imposed its will, especially down low. So, uh, so, you know, since this was a game against South Alabama and, you know, just kind of another game in a stretch uh, of a couple by games and a couple by games at home, that is, uh, I'm not going to go too much into the heavy details of what happened, but, uh, but, you know, I'll quickly recap for, for anyone that wasn't able to watch, I know a lot of people were were watching other football games or, or maybe just, you know, weren't getting to it. It started late as well uh, because some of the football games were, were running late on Big Ten Network. So uh, so for anyone who wasn't watching, uh, South Alabama jumped out to an early lead and then led for about the first 13 or so minutes of the game before Maryland took a lead. They went back and forth uh, towards the end of the first half. And then as Maryland started, the second half started to kind of, like I said, impose its will, pull away and really kind of seal that victory and the result wasn't really in doubt for two. I mean, the result the result was never really in doubt because, you know, this was a mismatch of two teams where Maryland was heavily favored, but um, there was never really a, a concern in the second half as to whether or not Maryland was going to win. But like I said, it wasn't an over, overwhelmingly resounding victory. And uh, and I will talk about why. And I, I will start with the, with the one thing that pops up on the stat sheet the most throughout this season so far and is the most concerning thing going on with this Maryland team so far, and that's three-point shooting. Maryland today, I have the stat sheet right in front of me if you see me looking down the video. Maryland shot five of 31 from three today. And the threes, you know, 31 threes is way too many for this team to be shooting. Quite frankly, uh, Maryland was getting nothing going from the perimeter. And really, the reason why this game was close to start was because Maryland was heavily relying on outside shots for its offense. South Alabama was in a 2-3 zone. Oftentimes, the easiest way to beat a 2-3 zone is to simply shoot over it, and Maryland was being dared by South Alabama, South Alabama to do so and simply took the bait. Um, it did not go well. Maryland, I believe, 10 of its first 14 shots, I believe, were three-pointers. 
um, and I think only one went in. So it, it was a really slow start offensively for Maryland. And that was, you know, mostly because of that three point shooting. Now, this three point shooting is not something that just popped up today. And we've talked about it on this podcast a couple of times, how this is the thing that I personally and I think a lot of people are most worried about is going to hold this team back, especially on the offensive end. You know, it's something to, to really be concerned about, especially because last year they weren't really that good of a three point shooting team. And you lose a couple of your top three point shooters. It's not super surprising that they're struggling to shoot threes this early in the season but it is quite surprising to the extent that they're doing it. Maryland, we were talking about it, me, me and some other reporters after the game. Uh, Maryland right now, as at the time I'm recording this, you know, just a couple hours after the basketball game ended, Maryland is one of the five or so worst three-point shooting teams in the entire country, at least by percentage basis. So, you know, this is something that isn't just us nitpicking a team. This is like a real problem that, you know, Maryland is – is going to be hampered by if it can't figure this out. And it's going to really end up costing them games if it hasn't already. You can make a very good argument that it's poor three-point shooting is the reason why it got off to such a slow start. Now, uh, they were able to figure it out later in the game. They started to you know, drop some more plays, get the ball down low a little bit more. Uh, Julian Reese had a really good game. He had 19 points and 15 rebounds. He led all players in both. He was tied with Dante Scott with the 19 points. Um, but, but a really impressive performance from him. It's about the third straight game it feels like where he's given the he's too little sign on uh on his celebration um and and rightfully so he was uh by far the most dominant player down low um but another player that really stuck out to me and stuck out to a lot of maryland fans i'm sure was jordan geronimo who had the best performance uh he's had in a maryland uniform so far it's a small sample size only six games but uh but jordan today had uh 14 points and six rebounds And uh, a lot of those points came in that second half surge at the beginning of the second half, Maryland went on a 23 to four run and really, like I said, pulled away and put the game out of reach for the Jaguars. But Jordan Geronimo today, really impressive and and really impressive down low. Maryland was doing a good job of getting him the ball. You know, Reese was giving him the ball. uh, Young was giving him the ball. Anyone was, was really willing to to find a gap in that zone that South Alabama was playing. And that's what, what Jordan did a really good job of, of getting himself in those spots where they could kind of break through the zone and get him good looks near the rim. Now, 14 points from Jordan Geronimo is not something that Maryland's going to bank on every game. Even Kevin Willard, who has said that he's trying to get Jordan more involved in the offense admits that that's not going to be the case moving forward, but just to see that was very encouraging. And, uh, you know, it's what you expected when you brought him in from Indiana. Now um, he's going to be that fifth starter. I think we've kind of figured out this year. Um, There was a lot of talk about would it be him? Would it be Jamie Kaiser? Maybe someone else steps up. No bachelor got to start earlier in the year, Um, but it looks like barring something really surprising happening or an injury or something along those lines, Jordan Geronimo is going to be in the starting lineup. And you're going to have that starting lineup of Jameer Young, Deshaun Harris-Smith, Dante Scott, Jordan Geronimo, and Julian Reese. And I think that's the best lineup Maryland has right now. I know Jamie Kaiser has a lot of upside supposedly, but you know, for a knockdown shooter, you know, he did not have a good game today. He went 0 for 5. Those were all threes. Um, and the threes weren't falling for anyone today, really, except for, you know, Dante Scott and, and Jameer Young were the only players to make threes for Maryland today. Um, but yeah, it looks like Jordan Geronimo is solidifying himself into that starter role. So that's something that we can expect moving forward. And as always, his tenacity on the defensive end really shown through. Um, one other note I will make, like I said, Jamie Kaiser went over five. He was not the only player to not score. In fact, interesting stat, only four players from Maryland scored today. You know, 68 points in a game is not particularly noteworthy. But then when you look at that and you only see that four players scored for Maryland, that's quite surprising. So I mentioned, you know, uh, Dante Scott and Julian Reese having 19 points apiece. But then you get, you know, 14 from Geronimo and then another 16 from Jameer Young. Deshaun Harris-Smith, you know, the fifth starter at at shooting guard, did not score today. Um, Was, you know, he was struggling. He was shooting threes like everyone else was and they weren't falling. He's not really a particularly great outside shooter regardless um, but yeah, today they, they definitely were not falling for him and really for anyone else, uh, Jahari Long and like I said, Jamie Kaiser and then Noah Bachelor as well got in. Noah did not take a shot, but, but no one other than those four players scored for Maryland today. So it wasn't a particularly balanced approach. It was pretty clear that they were relying on, on a couple guys to really do the business for them. And especially in that second half, it was really Reese and Geronimo that were taking over for them. Um, so, so that was, that was probably what, what stood out the most other than three point shooting, which is the fact that they were really relying on those guys. And Kevin Willard in the post game press conference was pretty blunt about it. He's, he's saying that, uh, Jameer Young 
and Dante Scott and Julian Reese, they're going to have to play a lot through those guys. And, and he's right. Those guys are going to have really high usage rates. Those guys are going to be the guys that you're going to need to have good games pretty much every game that you want to win. Um, and then if you can get a couple extra points from a guy like Jordan Geronimo, uh, that's an added bonus. And you assume that Dejon Harris-Smith is not going to go scoreless all too often. He's obviously still a freshman, so he's still figuring some stuff out. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the outside shots – they just can't be taking them at that kind of rate. And, and I think DHS really embodies that because he is not a particularly lethal outside shooter, but he is really good when he gets towards the rim. And at least you expect that to to become more of an emphasis moving forward. And maybe, you know, Maryland will, uh, will improve its shooting. We'll see Kevin Willard. I keep quoting Kevin Willard, but this is what he's been saying for, for really this entire season that um, he didn't necessarily expect the team to be shooting this poorly this early in the season, but, uh, but he did expect them to have some struggles and that he thinks they're going to get better. He would say that he knows they're going to get better. Um, my question would just be whether or not they're going to get better because they're actually going to improve or just because they can't possibly get worse because there's not much more room for them to get worse three point shooting. Um, but they have another game against Ryder coming up at home. That should be another opportunity to really tune things up before you go on Indiana uh, on the road to Indiana, excuse me, for the Big Ten opener. That'll be uh, probably their first test, really, other than that Villanova game. And they already lost two games in Asheville. So, you know, we we need to see a little bit more uh, impressive performance from them away from home. And then you got Penn State coming up at home as well. So you got two Big Ten games coming up in the near future. You know, you got to tune this stuff up before you really get into the meat of conference play. And that's really going to come back to bite you if you don't. But that all being said, I will circle this back and wrap up this segment by saying that this was a win for Maryland. They're back to 500, three and three. You expect them to beat Ryder, so that they should be over 500, at least overall record-wise, heading into that Indiana game. And uh, and from there, you know, you, you hope that this streak of home games, plus you have uh, a string of some more bye games in December as well with an opportunity to build up some wins. You hope that all of these, uh, these struggles that we are talking about, it's early in the season, so it's really easy to nitpick some of these things. You're hoping that Maryland can figure that out now, while maybe the stakes are a little bit lower, and then once you you know flip over into the new year, you have that road game at UCLA also in late December. You hope that maybe by then they've worked through these struggles and they can figure them all out. But we will see, and uh, and we'll be covering it all here on the podcast and over at TestudoTimes.com, where me and Andrew both did write ups of, uh, of the respective games that we covered. Um, it was you know not a great week for Maryland athletics last week, but uh, but a good weekend, like he said, with uh, with Talia Tungavailoa breaking the the Big Ten passing yards record and Maryland men's basketball kind of getting on track here this past week with two straight wins. Thanks everyone for listening so much. We really appreciate it. The the support throughout football season has been really awesome. And even though the regular season is over, we're going to keep having more content coming out related to football. We'll be figuring out what bowl game they're going to. I know Andrew said that the team's really hoping for Vegas. That would certainly be, be an interesting trip out West. And then, you know, there's all sorts of other stuff happening around the league and and uh, especially with basketball we'll really be honing in on that as that kind of becomes the main star of the show in the Maryland athletics world but uh but once again thanks everyone for listening and we will be back soon with another episode